All right, let's get started. So the title of this talk is Node.js Native Add-ons for High Performance Numeric Computing. So this is a quick introduction to, to me. I'm Athan Rains um, from San Francisco. And what I do is I work on f open source full time. And in particular, I work on a project called Standard Lib, which provides a standard library for Node.js and JavaScript with an emphasis on numeric computing. And it was through this work that I became acquainted and that I use on a daily basis uh, Node native add-ons for machine learning, for statistics, for time series analysis, et cetera. So this talk will be technical. There are a number of uh, slides with source code. And I'm not going to spend too much time on them, only pausing long enough to highlight key points. This talk is available online. Just go to my GitHub, and you'll find the talk repository. And so you can review it after this talk and after the conference. So the talk overview is as follows. Uh, I'll give an intro to Node native add-ons for those that maybe not as familiar with the uh, ecosystem and the tool chains. I will introduce the tool chain for authoring native add-ons. I'll discuss native add-ons within the context of numeric computing. I'll then walk through a basic example of how we think about native add-ons and how we compile them. I'll extend that basic example to working with low-level linear algebra libraries written in Fortran. I'll talk a little bit about performance uh, of native add-ons, especially compared to native JavaScript implementations. I'll talk about some of the challenges that we have faced uh, writing native add-ons and how we've addressed those. Before concluding, I'll touch on NAPI, which is an application binary interface, or ABI, which provides um, compatibility across node versions. And then I'll offer some conclusions and point you to some resources for getting started for doing uh, native add-ons for high-performance numeric computing. So native add-ons. A native add-on provides an interface between JavaScript running in Node.js and C and C++ libraries. And from the perspective of Node.js applications, an add-on is just another module that that application can require. And add-ons have access to four components. The first component is V8. Now, V8 is a C++ library which runs JavaScript and allows creating objects and calling functions, et cetera. The second component is libuv. libuv is the C library which implements the Node.js event loop, worker threads, and async behavior and allows interacting with uh, the file system, sockets, timers, and system events. Then there's internal libraries. Now, these are Node.js exposed C++ APIs. And the fourth component is Node's own dependencies. These are statically linked libraries, such as OpenSSL. Now, in terms of some example add-ons that you may work with on a daily basis, uh, one of them is Level Down, which provides a C++ uh, binding to Level DB. There's NanoMessage. There's Node Canvas, which is a Cairo-backed uh, HTML5 Canvas implementation. There's SQLite 3. And then there's Standard Lib, the project that I work on that provides bindings to low-level linear algebra libraries. So why would you choose a native add-on over plain JavaScript? Now, there are four primary reasons. The first reason is that you want to link to existing C and C++ libraries. This allows you to avoid having to port and re-implement functionality in JavaScript, and for large code bases, would require a significant time and investment. Next, you may want to access lower-level APIs, such as worker threads. Third, you may want to have access to language features which are not available in JavaScript, such as 64-bit such as integers or SMID. And then fourth, you may need a performance boost, including leveraging hardware-optimized libraries. So now that we've motivated maybe some reasons that you may want to use add-ons, how do you go about doing so? And this brings us to the native add-on tool chain. We begin with node gip. Now, node gip is a command line tool written primarily in JavaScript and is used for compiling native add-ons for Node.js. And node gip bundles gip and automatically downloads various depend, uh, development files and headers that are uh, targeted for uh, specific Node.js versions. GIP, which stands for Generate Your Own Project, is a meta build system, which builds other build systems depending on the target platform. 
And the aim of GIP is to replicate as closely as possible the native build setup of a target platform IDE. So for example, on Mac OS, that means generating Xcode projects. On Windows, that would be generating Microsoft Visual Studio projects. And once GIP generates these project files, then you run those files to actually build your add-on. So historically, developing native add-ons has been a difficult process. And there have been many challenges in doing so. And the foremost challenge has been handling breaking changes in V8. Now, this isn't so much the case now. Uh, development practices on the V8 team have changed. But historically, it hasn't been the case. Because in the past, the V8 team has, was not really concerned about backward compatibility and would introduce significant changes, often removing, adding, replacing interfaces and functionality. And these changes would force add-on authors to effectively rewrite their packages, publish a new major version. It would make backward compati compatibility really difficult. And so to alleviate some of the pain of nat native add-ons, members of the Node.js community created a package called NAN, uh, which stands for Native Abstractions for Node.js. And what NAN attempts to do is it attempts to provide a stable abstraction layer over native, uh, that native add-on authors can target. And internally, NAN handles the complex logic required to maintain functionality from one V8 version to the next. And while NAN has been beneficial, even it has introduced breaking changes. Another issue is GIP. Now, GIP was designed with a particular use case in mind, and that use case was Chrome. It was not designed to build native add-ons. This is something that Node.js ecosystem has kind of absorbed um, into the project, but it's not specifically oriented to building native add-ons. And furthermore, GIP documentation is either poor or incomplete. Uh, and in fact, it's abandonware. No, the Google team does not maintain uh, GIP anymore. They moved to GN, which targets Ninja. And so because of the poor documentation, you end up spending considerable time searching the internet for other packages which use native add-ons to see how they handle special configurations. And if you want to do anything other than C and C++ bindings, such as Fortran or CUDA or Go or Rust, you know, good luck, because resources are few and far between. And a more forward-looking concern is that the entire tool chain is very much biased toward V8, um, and meaning that the tool chain is not engine neutral. And this means that compiling Node and Node.js native add-ons for alternative engines, uh, such as so uh, Chakra, is less straightforward, often requiring shims, such as Chakra uh, shim. Now, despite these challenges, um, native add-ons are highly important for numeric computing. And native add-ons are important for numeric computing because they allow us to interface with high-performance numeric computing libraries written in Fortran and C and C++. Because the reality is, is that when you read the source code of Julia or R or Python libraries such as NumPy and SciPy, a lot of the functionality that they expose is really just wrappers for existing numeric co code bases written in Fortran, C, and C++. So for example, for high-performance linear algebra, um, these platforms will wrap BLAST or LAWPACK. Um, if they need to do fast Fourier transforms, they'll wrap FFTW. And Julia, for big int, they use GMP. Um, for big float, Julia uses MPFR. These are just C libraries. So native add-ons allow us to do something similar. Namely, we can expose high-performance numeric computing functionality to Node.js and to JavaScript. And this means that we can leverage highly optimized libraries, which have been used with great success for decades. And we don't have to focus on rewriting implementa uh, implementations. So in summary, native add-ons allow us to do in Node.js what other environments used for numeric computing can do. So at this point, we've discussed at a very high level what native add-ons are, the tool chain, some challenges, and motivated why they're important for numeric computing. So let's move on to a basic example. Now, the canonical example that I always use is how to compute the hypotenuse, avoiding underflow and overflow. The implementation isn't so important. All we want to do right now is to walk through how we, can, how we compile a native add-on. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're first going to define a basic header file. And this defines the interface of the function that's going to be exposed to the JavaScript runtime, taking care to guard against name mangling, et cetera, and ensuring similar behaviors you might see with a, a standard C compiler. Once we've defined that header file, we can now write our implementation. And this is just a standard C implementation, which imports the standard math library. 
and includes a function which accepts two arguments, x and y, and returns a numeric result. Pretty straightforward. Once our implementation is finished, we need to create a wrapper written in C++, which calls that C function. And this is really our add-on interface here. So what you need to focus on is you need to note the inclusion of NAN. And recall that NAN provides a stable API across V8 versions. And most of the C++ is simply wrapping and unwrapping object values. And the function interface takes a single argument, which is your arguments object, similar to the arguments uh, array or array-like object in JavaScript. And once we've done that, we basically do some input argument sanity checks, and then we unwrap those values x and y. And once those values are unwrapped, we pass them to our C function, return the result um, by setting the value. And the last thing that we do is we export an initialization function, which is required of every Node.js native add-on. And importantly, it defines the method name that we want to, to export. And I should note that we did not have to write this implementation in the add-on.cpp file. Uh, we could have directly written in this file and done our implementation here. However, using separate files does two things. First, it facilitates reusability of source files in non-add-on context, and second, um, this is a more common scenario when working with existing code bases. So now that we've created those three files, we need to create a binding.gip file. Now, it's this file which Gip uses to generate the build project for the target platform. And in Gip terminology, we define a target name. Here, it's add-on. And once we've defined the target name, then we define the sources. And once we've defined the source files that we want to compile, we say the include directories. This is where the header files are going to be. And here what we're using is we're using command expansion for Gip to evaluate this particular string. And this particular string simply requires the NAN library. And when NAN is required, it prints the standard out the location of header files, allowing you to, to dynamically resolve where NAN header files are located. Once we've created these four files, we can now build our add-on. And to do so, we first navigate to the directory that has our binding.git file. Then we generate the build project files. Remember that Git is a meta uh, build system. So it generates the, the build files using a configure subcommand. And once those, um, that, that command has been run, on Unix, that will generate a make file. On Windows, that will be a vch proj file. Um, and once those files are generated, we can then run the build subcommand to actually compile that add-on. Once compiled, we can use the exported function in JavaScript. And as may be observed in the require statement, the add-on exports an object with a method whose name matches the export name we defined when we wrote our add-on.cpp file. And when invoked, this function behaves just like a comparable function implemented in JavaScript, accepting numeric arguments and returning a number. So we've implemented this add-on, but we should also ask ourselves, like, how does performance compare to an implementation written purely in JavaScript? So here are benchmarks uh, run on my laptop running Node version 8, which has one of the latest releases of V8. And in the first row, what I'm showing is I'm showing the results for the built-in hypot function. And this is provided by the standard JavaScript math library. And we, we can see that on my machine, we compute around 4 million operations per second. On the next row, I'm showing the results for the native add-on. And we can see that we have a slight performance boost of around 800,000 operations per second. And lastly, I'm showing the results of an equivalent implementation written in JavaScript. And we can see that for when compared to the add-on performance, we get about 2.5 million more operations per second, which is actually a pretty significant performance boost. And I have two comments about this. The first is that simply because we can write code in C, this does not mean that we will achieve better performance by doing so. Um, and this is largely due to the performance overhead or the cost of calling into the add-on itself. And second, simply because a, um, something that is standard, in this case, math.hypot coming from the standard math library, th this does not mean that it is performant in an absolute sense. Often, you can write user land implementations which are more performant as long as you restrict the input argument domain and you are wise in which algorithms that you choose. So that concludes the basic example. What I want to move to now is BLAS. Now, BLAS stands for Basic Linear Algebra Subprograms. And these are routines that provide standard implementations for, for, for performing uh, basic vector and matrix operations. 
And blast routines are split into three levels. The first level um, correspond to scalar, vector, and vector vector operations. Level two blasts corresponds to matrix vector operations, and level three blasts corresponds to matrix matrix operations. And blast routines are commonly used in the development of high quality linear algebra software, for example, uh, LawPack, due to their efficiency, their portability, and their wide availability. And they are foundational for most modern numeric computing environments. So an example blast routine um, is the level one function DAWSUM, which stands for double absolute value sum. Now, as the name may suggest, um, this function com computes the sum of absolute values over a vector whose uh, value types is double. And the algorithm is not particularly interesting, but we should just note that it's written in Fortran, and it should prove illustrative in terms of how we might expose this or a similar function to JavaScript. Now, recall that native add-ons are intended to provide C, C++ bindings, in which case the first thing we need to do is we need to provide a C interface to this Fortran function. However, um, the first obstacle to doing so is that we cannot use DAWSUM directly in C, because Fortran expects arguments to be passed by reference rather than by value. And furthermore, while not applicable here, uh, Fortran functions cannot return arrays. They can only return scalar values. Thus, the general best practice is to wrap Fortran um, functions as subroutines, which is the equivalent of a C function returning void. And we also pass a pointer for storing the output value. So in which case, the first thing we have to do is we have to wrap our Fortran function as a subroutine, as done here in this slide. Now, similar to our first example, um, we need to create a header file defining the subroutine prototype. Pretty straightforward. And once we've created those three files, um, we now need to create the header file containing the prototype for our C wrapper. And in this case, we just use a naming convention where we have C underscore and then the method name. Once we've defined that header file that defines our prototype, we then uh, implement our actual implementation, which is straightforward in this case. All we do is we take the input arguments and we pass them by reference to that Fortran subroutine. Now that we have our C interface, we now need to create our add-on wrapper. And similar to before, we use NAN, um, which provides that stable API across node versions. And similar to before, we perform some basic input argument type checking. Uh, before unwrapping input values. Now, there's one thing to note here, and that's that we need to repurpose the typed array that we, that we provide as a C vector. This can be a relatively expensive operation, especially for small vectors, and you need to remember this for future benchmarks that I'll be showing. And once we've unwrapped our input arguments, we simply pass them to our C function, and we return the result. So compiling our add-on is not as straightforward as before. Recall that GIP is oriented towards C and C++. And here we have to compile Fortran. So we need to be able to teach GIP how to compile Fortran. And this means that our configuration is going to get quite a bit more complex. Now, forgetting the add-on for a second, um, if we were going to compile just the C and Fortran, we might proceed as follows. First, what we need to do is we need to compile our Fortran files, uh, specifying the compiler as well as any command line flags. And then we also need to compile our C files. Once again, specifying the, the compiler as well as any command line flags. And once those source files are compiled, then we link them together into a single library, also specifying standard Fortran libraries. So to compile our add-on, we need to translate this sequence or something similar to a GIP configuration file. And how we do that is we begin by defining variables within our binding.gip. And while GIP automatically sets C and C++ compiler flags, we need to explicitly say what the Fortran compiler is, as well as any command line flags to use. In this case, we're saying that we want to use gFortran. And this means that, depending on the host platform, you need to find out what your host compiler actually is. GIP, by default, when it uh, compiles C and C++, can automatically detect which compiler it should use. So after defining variables, we need to define targets. In this case, we, just, we use command expansion within the GIP file to automatically generate the add-on target name. And then uh, we also specify the include directories, just like we did before, as well as source files. And then once we've done that, we specify command line flags based on the host platform. Now, in order to compile Fortran files, we have to tell GIP how to process them. 
and we do so by defining a rule uh, that is triggered based on a file's file name extension. And we also explicitly define what the input and output arguments should be when running the command execution for generating um, the actual add-on. Finally, what we do is we define an action that, that, the, that Gip needs to take when it's going to actually compile these files. And this means that we need to specify the Fortran compiler as well as all the command line flags. Now, similar to our basic example, um, to build the add-on, we simply navigate to that binding.git file. We use the configure subcommand to generate the project files, and then we run the build subcommand to actually compile the native add-on. And to use the add-on, we simply require it, we use that method, and we use it just as a comparable JavaScript method. Now, to measure add-on performance, we can benchmark against an equivalent implementation written in plain JavaScript. Each row in the table corresponds to an input array length. Now, the two middle columns correspond to operations per second. And the last column is the relative performance of the native add-on to the JavaScript implementation. And what we can see is that for small arrays, JavaScript is significantly faster. However, that advantage disappears as soon as we reach an array length of 100 elements. And as I mentioned earlier, array unwrapping and reinterpretation as a C vector can have significant performance impacts um, for small arrays. However, that cost is largely constant, and it becomes negligible as array length increases. For large input arrays, the add-on is significantly more performant, nearly six times as performant as the JavaScript implementation. However, our Blast journey is not over. And the Fortran's reference implementation does not take into account hardware capabilities or chip architecture, and is thus the, not the most performant implementation we can have. For optimal performance, we'd rather use a hardware-optimized Blast. Uh, on Mac OS, this would mean using the Apple Accelerate framework. On Intel chips, this would mean using Intel's math kernel library, or MKL. And then for a cross-platform independent library, you could use OpenBLAST. So as an example, if we wanted to use the Apple Accelerate framework, we could proceed as follows. So first, just as we've done before, we need to create a header file which defines the prototype of the function that we want to use in that hardware-optimized Blast library that's located on the host platform. The function signature is the same, but now we're using the C Blast naming convention. Next, to prevent having to create multiple add-on files, each with the different naming conventions, what we typically do is we create wrapper files to standardize the names across the different uh, optimized Blast libraries. In this case, we just simply wrap the cblast.sum with a c.sum function just passing the arguments through. Now we can modify the binding.gip file to no longer include configuration settings and rules for compiling Fortran files. Instead, we just simply specify the library that we want to link to. In this case, it is systemblast. Building and compiling the add-on now follows the same procedure as before. When we benchmark the hardware-optimized Blast libraries against equivalent implementations in JavaScript, we get the following results. So as with the reference implementation, the native add-on is slower for short array lengths. However, as we increase array length, um, the add-on achieves significantly better performance, even for an array length of 100, and better performance compared to the reference implementation. Note that I've also included WebAssembly benchmarks here. Now, for those hoping that WebAssembly will remove the need for native add-ons and achieve similar performance, you are mistaken. The main conclusion of these results is to use hardware-optimized libraries if possible. These results are simply not possible otherwise. So at this point, you may be excited seeing 20x performance improvements. However, detecting and or installing hardware-optimized libraries is hard. And it's hard for several reasons. First is that some hardware-optimized libraries have bugs that you need to provide patches for, such as the Apple Accelerate framework. Next, resolving library installation in a robust way um, is difficult, as no standard locations or naming conventions are codified. Third, some hardware-optimized libraries are proprietary, such as MKL, and cannot be guaranteed to exist on, target platform, uh, on your target platform. Fourth is that hardware-optimized Blast on Windows is really painful. And in general, Fortran on Windows is really painful. Um, and it's, this problem is compounded by Node-GIP using Microsoft Visual Studio on Windows. It's a dependency. And Microsoft Visual Studio does not ship with a Fortran compiler. So you really can't compile these hardware-optimized hardware libraries 
written in Fortran on Windows. Fifth, while OpenBLAST is close, there's no fully robust and, uh, and cross-platform hardware-optimized library um, that you can use alongside your, your add-on, which means that you always need to ship a reference implementation fallback. And for those environments where you cannot compile a native add-on, you also need to ship a JavaScript implementation as a fallback. So in short, to handle cross-platform complexity, your binding.git files become very complex very fast. So that concludes the examples of, for doing high-performance linear algebra. Um, I want to briefly touch upon NAPI, which stands for, oh, wait, sorry, it's a Node API for Node.js native add-ons. And there are three key features to an API. The first is stability. It provides a stable API abstraction, similar in goals to NAN. Second is compatibility. And what it tries to do is ensure compatibility across node versions. And third, its key differentiator is VM neutrality. And what this means is it provides the same API across node VMs, such as, VM, such as V8 or Chakra. In short, in API promises native add-ons which will just work, which is great. That's the future of authoring native add-ons. So as an example of what an in API add-on might look like, and I say might because the implementation is not finalized and it's actually still experimental, here's that first example that I showed refactored from NAN to in API. Now the first notable difference is that we no longer call V8 methods directly. Instead, we always go through NAPI. That's these uh, NAPI prefix functions. The second notable difference is that our return values are always references, are always pointers to values that we want to return. What is returned from function invocations is a status variable, which says whether a function invocation succeeded or failed. Otherwise, a native add-on follows the same general structure, as well as the fact that you need to export an initialization function. So everything is pretty much the same, it's just that you're going to be using different methods. And in fact, the NAPI authors have worked very hard to provide a way of automatically porting uh, a NAN add-on to NAPI. So there are three points that I want you to remember from this talk. The first is that native add-ons allow us to achieve parity with other numeric computing environments. Second is that native add-ons may provide a performance boost, but a performance improvement is not guaranteed. Add-on authors need to carefully evaluate the algorithms and implementations that they use, and they need to do proper benchmarking. We have seen, however, that native add-ons, when done well, especially using hardware optimization, can achieve unparalleled performance. Third is that NAPI promises a less painful add-on future and represents important progress in helping make sure that Node.js and JavaScript become a first-class computing environment. So parity, performance, and progress. So with that, that pretty much concludes my talk. If you want to find out more add-on examples, um, be sure to check out StandardLib. As I mentioned, it's a standard library for JavaScript and Node.js with an emphasis on numeric computing, where we have many of these add-on examples as well as add-on resources. You can just go to GitHub slash standardlib dash js standardlib. So with that, Thank you very much, and I'll be around throughout the rest of the day if you have any questions. Thank you.